Hello class. <clears throat> I thought I'd do a brief introduction to identifying things under the microscope, um, particularly things that might be in your pond water samples or creek samples or whatever. Uh, protists, microscopic animals, small algae, that sort of thing. Um, it's, uh, it's a little difficult. It's really daunting at first when you first, you know, put a drop of water under a microscope and see all kinds of crazy little things moving around and it's like, well, where do I even start? So hopefully this video will give you a place to start and how to put that into context with the project that you might be doing. So uh, let me move into a share screen mode and then we will um, we'll do some uh, power pointing our way through this exciting event. <laughs> oh, look at that. Um, yeah, so getting to know protists, that's our goal here. Um, so my thought is we'll start with the ecology and then move into the more specific identifications because that's really the purpose of doing this in our case is to uh is to sort of um, uncover the ecology so you might be working on a project on um, the change in co2 and its effect on aquatic ecology and so what you're really interested in is how does the ecosystem change in response to your treatment and so this is a, a diagram done by um, some students. Uh, it's kind of clever uh, in a way. So they identified all of these different species. So that's like going through their slides, identifying all these different types. And then they put together this diagram, which is the sort of uh, ecological web of, uh, of their system. And they, they varied the size based upon the abundance. So the euglena obviously was the most abundant organism and some of the least um, abundant organisms included things like the clostridium and the paramecium and things. Um, one thing that's interesting about it is that when you start to put the little arrows like who eats whom, two things you recognize right away. One is some, some organisms are um, more like keystone species and a keystone species in an ecological web is one that uh, interacts with more of the other species. It could be like this rotifer here, um, eating so many of the other species. You can see it's a it's a it's a primary predator. Um, it's an organism that that sort of uh, structures the community below by eating so many of the other individuals. Right, keeps their populations under control and things. Um, so those are those are keystones. And then there are things like euglena, which might be a primary producer, which drives the energy of the system, right? Where most of the, um, you can see, in fact, the euglena, the volvox, the clusterium, uh, and the spirogyra, those are the main primary producers, um, the foundation, if you will, of this, uh, of this food web. So, so it's pretty interesting to kind of do this. And then if you did a treatment and you found that it shifted in abundance or different species, you know, became more abundant than others, um, then you can talk about the, uh, like how the system is adjusting. Okay, so um, there are different roles that um, these little organisms can play. And so on this little graphic at the bottom, you'll see uh, protists listed and then some roles that can be played. Phototrophic would be the, um, or autotrophic, these are, uh, these are the photosynthesizers. Mixotrophic are species that can do both, uh, both photosynthesis and heterotrophy, which is on there as well. Heterotrophy means you eat somebody else. Um, and then parasitoid, but we won't worry so much about parasitoid, that's a little harder to figure out. And then the bacteria they have over here on the far right on the uh, x-axis really can play all these different roles. For example, cyanobacteria are very capable of being primary producers, they're phototrophs, um, whereas there are many others that serve roles more as decomposers, which isn't even listed here. But a lot of the bacteria are decomposers. So when these larger organisms die, bacteria swarm around them and decompose them. So these are the kind of roles that you can, uh, you can see. Um, on the y-axis, by the way, here, they have sort of broken down into different sizes. And it's really important. Um, even this diagram is really misleading. Uh, for example, if you had some little single-celled, um, I guess, green algae here, they're gonna be really tiny in comparison to say some of these larger um, animals um, like crustaceans 
um, and it looks like a water mite there, these would be much, much larger and much, much larger than, say, these diatoms. And you can see by looking at that scale, this is sort of an order of magnitude jump at each level. So there's a wide variety of sizes that kind of gets confusing. And I'll try to point some of these out later in a, in a microscope slide photo that I've got for you. So um, your project really, you know, I mean, you're going to be looking at particular treatments and their effects on the ecology of these systems. But the, um, you, you, you might also consider that there are all kinds of factors uh, beyond your treatment that can cause these varieties. For example, in this graphic, you can see that the uh, microbial communities in, in, in this particular subalpine lake change throughout the seasons. Um, and then you might think, well, wow, why does the species richness go up and down through the seasons? And think of all the factors that change with season. In this case, as a subalpine lake, my guess is temperature would be the first main thing. As temperature warms into the summer, things get become more abundant. Uh, and then secondly, there would be things like nutrients. So um, as, uh, as you get a spring thaw, and snow melts, that's a lot of the water coming into a subalpine lake that carries with it a bunch of nutrients that would then um, also increase the uh, diversity in a, uh, in a lake. So um, any system you have is going to have multiple potential things that, that change the, um, the diversity. Um, there are lots of um, papers on things like, well, you know, like having greater um, heterogeneity in this in the sample. So if you have a stream with big rocks and small rocks and plants and leaf litter and dappled sunlight and shade and all these different microhabitats could also generate a larger biodiversity because of the heterogeneity of the environment. So lots of potential things can influence that. Um, you know uh, from, it, maybe, maybe you know, but maybe you do, maybe you know from our discussion of uh, evolution, that uh, endosymbiosis is the evolutionary um, origin of most of the different protist or eukaryotic cell types. And uh, as you start to do this, you might start to recognize some of these, like here's euglena, right? There's a the green algal lineage um, where you have a chloroplast with um, uh, chlorophylls A and B, and then that merges with a flagellate the um, the or the sort of green algal um, um, cell to begin with becomes sort of the uh, internal organelles of the larger organism, which is the euglena. Um, you can look down at the bottom here. These are all members of dinophyto, which are the dinoflagellates, and uh, you can see that's a, um, a paraphyletic group. That is a group with multiple origins of different. Um, endosymbiotic events. If you follow this one back, you'll note that there's a place where there are things like diatoms, which is one of the phyla you will undoubtedly see, uh, Basilaria phyta, and, uh, and then they get taken in by another flagellate group, which then become the, uh, the, the main organism with the dinophytes being the, uh, I'm sorry, with the uh, um, diatoms becoming the little organelles within. So it's, uh, it's really crazy to think about these lineages and this evolutionary process. So you're really getting to see the results of a really amazing um, evolutionary process in looking at protists. Um, when you organize them taxonomically, these are two different sort of trees here. The one on the left is probably the one similar to maybe in your textbook. And um, <laughs> they have real trouble organizing protists into groups, taxonomic groups, um, because um, they're not actually a tree. You notice both of these, in fact, all the, the, they always try to put it into a tree as though it were sort of a branching pattern that started with one and went to two and then four, et cetera. But that's not how um, protists evolve. They, they're, um, they're anastomosing. They branch and then they come back together. And then this one and that one branch and then those branches come back together to make new ones. And this recombination process um, creates a great amount of diversity. It's a, it generates all kinds of novelty. Um, but it does not lend itself to organization in a tree. So I think it's funny biologists over and over try to force this back into a tree. Anyways, so you have these groups that are related, and they're related because of the subcellular structures that they have, which are obviously part of their history, um, 
endosymbiotically. But anyways, so these in the yellow, this, this whole area here are sometimes referred to as supergroups. There are groups that, um, you know, that share certain characteristics. In this little tree on this side also, they have some supergroups um, with slightly different names. And, um, and they, they try to put a bunch of these level phyla, if you will, into these supergroups, um, where traditionally you would have put kingdoms. Right, I mean, if, if you had the old five kingdom system. Um, really, these are, it's very difficult to figure out. Uh, perhaps you will come up with a better way to organize these than anyone has done before. But anyway, so if you're looking in your textbook, you'll see these called supergroups. And you notice that in that, you also have something called fungi, animals, and plantae, which are traditionally thought of as kingdoms. So perhaps Euglenozoa is a kingdom, right? Or perhaps it's a supergroup and animalia is a supergroup as well. Hard to say. Um, and, and so depending on where you look it up, if you just sort of like, oh, I found a Euglena, and then you type that into Wikipedia, you may get a totally different phyla name. And so don't worry, if I ever mark something wrong or take off some points because of your taxonomic delineations, if I ask you about it, just show me where you got the info. I understand there are many, many different alternatives. Um, currently, <laughs> as of 2020, um, there's a group, and I'll, I'll post this uh, reference for you in the uh, Canvas page, um, but there's, this is the most modern version of the, uh, the taxonomy of protists. Once again, they fit it to a tree, <laughs> and that's actually an artifact of the software they use. They're using a, a software that compares gene sequences to generate this tree. So the ones that have, the, the groups that have similar gene sequences are found together on branches of this tree. Um, you know, that's an interesting way to go. It, it sort of um, doesn't look at the events um, of endosymbiosis that would lead to this, but no, nonetheless, it's an okay way to organize it. Um, I put up here, I added a few things like, oh, all the chlorophytes and plants are here in Archeplastida. Um, you, fungi, and amoebas are all in this new group called Amorphia, which I kind of like, Am amorphic, right? That's kind of cool. That's, a, that's an interesting name. Um, crumbs is interesting, although I don't know any of the groups in there. I kind of like that they have these crazy new names. Um, Euglena, which you'll undoubtedly see many of, are found in this group called Discoba. <laughs> I, I'm sure there's some fun creative things you could do with this. And many of the other groups, undoubtedly you will find ciliates and diatoms, for example, and they're all found in this group, Zar, which they put in this thread. <laughs> I don't know, maybe this is kind of the communist group within the, uh, within it. I, I don't know, I don't know why they've used this. But anyhow, um, yeah, so there you go. Uh, this is the most modern sort of, and, and so now these all would be considered the uh, supergroups, if you will. You might um, think of them differently, right? Uh, but nonetheless, um, they're, they're sort of the major taxonomic groups. So if that didn't confuse you, we'll move on. So um, now from a practical perspective, like, okay, I'm gonna identify stuff in my microscope slide. Step one, you can say, well, is it green, gold, or greenish blue? <laughs> If they are, then undoubtedly they're doing photosynthesis. They have chlorophyll A, which is kind of a greenish color, and then they might have chlorophyll B, C, or even D, these other chlorophylls, which give them slightly different contrasts. Green algae all have sort of chlorophyll A and B, so they're kind of a grassy green color, whereas diatoms in the uh, phylum Basilaria phyta are kind of a golden color because of their chlorophyll A and C1 and maybe C2. And cyanobacteria have chlorophyll A, only, mostly, and they're uh, kind of a bluish green color. Anyways, um, we can look at some more detailed examples in the phylum chlorophyta, the green algae. You can have long filamentous forms like the spirogyra over here on the left, um, or many sort of little groups, clusters, or even single-celled individuals. Um, so the uh, syndesmus, this guy here, not uncommon in your samples. Um, chlorella, little green dots. And they, the chlorella is like bulletproof, man. They grow anywhere. They, they even grow in like a swimming pool that's got tons of, you know, <laughs> chemicals in there to keep them from growing. You'll often see these guys. Some of you I know have already seen the clusterium, these sort of half moon shapes. 
Um, Euglena actually doesn't belong in here because they're sort of a separate, they're a completely different phylum. Um, Chlamydomonas are tiny little green dots that move rather quickly. Euglena are often also tiny green dots or green, you know, elongate shapes. Um, the difference between the Chlamydomonas, which moves with a flagella, and the Euglena, which moves with a flagella, um, is that the Euglenoids always have a red dot somewhere in their cell if you look close you can see a little red eye spot um anyways all of these guys grassy green um kind of vary in cell shapes and things but they're pretty distinct in their color um when you think about sort of a bluish green color typically it's things like the cyanobacteria now cyanobacteria can be this filamentous shape like this this one here um, or they can be sort of like small greenish blue dots as well. Um, bacteria in general come in all kinds of shapes, as you can see here. Spirochete bacteria are kind of corkscrew shaped and they whip through the water like this. Coxie are little round dots. Uh, bacilli look like little hot dogs. Um, there's probably even some, um, you know, things like uh, multiple coxie um, groups in here. And there are also multiple bacillus groups. Anyways, when you see a lot of bacteria, like in this particular slide, um, it, it usually tells you something about the um, ecology of that system. The more bacteria that are present, especially if you see lots of spirochetes whipping through the water, it's often a decomposing system. So if you were to pick up like leaf litter from the bottom of a pond or something, you might see bacteria like this and they're moving around a lot and then working actively to decompose dead materials. Um, yeah, and it's also like <laughs> from a health standpoint, you know, you don't really want a mouthful of this kind of bacteria <laughs> if you can avoid it because there may be some really strange things in there that you wouldn't want to get. Anyway, cyanobacteria are uh, truly bacteria but they're kind of large, you can see compared to the other bacterial cells. Some are colonial. The cyanobacteria also move, they can glide through the water. And um, anyway, so they make kind of a unique uh, contribution. Sometimes they are the, um, the primary producer of choice in systems. Uh, in some, um, especially those that are kind of semi-anoxic, um, you may have all cyanobacteria in there and they may be super abundant and, um, and be the primary producers. In the evolutionary history of life on this planet, they were the first major primary producer and there are fossil cyanobacteria that go back 2.8 billion years. And they're probably responsible for most of the oxygen in our systems today. So as a, as a point of scale, to give you an idea, I talked about this earlier that they are orders of magnitude different. Uh, this large grassy green filament here is a chlorophyta green algae. Um, the diatoms, which we've talked about a little bit, vary in size, but they're all this lovely golden color. You can see several of them there. And then there's a cyanobacterial filament of the same type that you saw in the previous slide. So now you can imagine those bacteria, which were much smaller, you probably couldn't even make out except maybe as the smallest dots at this magnification on a microscope slide. So be aware that you kind of, you know, that <laughs> there are different scales of things going on. And although you may see pictures that all look the same size, um, these organisms are not. Okay, I mentioned diatoms. Here's some more diatom shapes. Once again, they all have this lovely sort of golden color to them, um, but they have a glass test, silica dioxide test, like a shell that they live inside. And so they have these terrific geometries that are very um, distinct for every species. They can be sort of long and lance shaped, um, oval. Um, there aren't pictures here, but they can be round. They can form long filaments, you know, all in a row. Um, oftentimes you'll find um, like a central area on them with two other areas that can be colored. Um, they often have two large golden chloroplasts and a nucleus in the middle. Um, anyway, so sometimes if you look really close, you can see these little teeny lines and these glass shells have little slits in them where the um, sort of amoeboid projections come out from the cell, uh, which give them the ability to move around. They can actually move, use their sort of a little amoeboid projections to, uh, to glide through the water. Um, diatoms 
sorry, are really interesting in that they can, uh, they do photosynthesis, obviously. One of the major primary producers in many different waters, including marine systems. Um, but they can also produce a lot of toxins. Um, there's one called Pseudonychia, I believe, that's found in our shores, uh, you know, on the coast. And they can produce a neurotoxin called demoic acid, which when these phytoplankton bloom can cause neurodegeneration in seabirds, um, seals, and even surfers. <laughs> uh, there's a risk and there have been dogs and stuff that have been running on the beach that had neurological lesions caused by the demoic acid produced by these. So they're a very interesting group. Um, getting away from the primary producers, these are the first level consumers uh, in a group called ciliata. They're, uh, they're ciliates. And so they don't have flagella or amoeboid projections, but they have these cilia, which are like little hairs. And you can see on this paramecium here, they're kind of barely visible around the edge. Um, and, and this guy, um, this is Euplodes. They can kind of come together to form what looks like little legs. And these guys kind of crawl around, but they're not, they're not animals. They're, uh, these are all single celled. Um, you might find algal cells within them because they've eaten them. So sometimes you'll see little green algal blobs inside that, but it's only because they eat them. Um, and sometimes you'll see them buzzing around in the, um, in the water column and kind of like hitting something and then tearing it apart like a little chainsaw. And they, uh, they can do that to help tear things apart and then eat the parts that they get. I'll show you in a moment a, a, a little bit better video of them moving. Um, Vorticella and, and some other relatives, these are stocked um, ciliates. So let's see if we can get these guys to move a little bit for you. Um, Vorticella is a protozoan that belongs to the phylum Ciliophora. There are over a hundred different species of vorticella. Looking at the top right of this vorticella, we can see a small particle is trapped by its waving cilia and is eventually moved to its oral groove. This is the reason behind the reproduction in vorticella is accomplished by budding. The cell splits down its length. Result. Anyway, so I, I didn't want to bore you with the entire video during a video, <laughs> a meta, a video and a video. Anyways, the Vorticella, you can see here, that's a spirogyra single cell uh, or, or filamentous green algae. The Vorticella can be bigger than this. They can be a little bit larger even than the, than the green algae you see, but they always have these stalks that they're, they're attached with. And you'll see other stalked ciliates that attach to the surface of things. It's one of the useful things when you're um, exploring the biodiversity of your sample is to scrape off the container walls, scrape on the bottom, pick up pieces of like little, you know, dirt at the bottom or leaf litter that might be in there and look on the surface because a lot of things attach to the surface of things that aren't just floating around in the water. So if you just took like a, a drop of the water floating around, you may not actually find much because in fact, a lot of this stuff is attached to something else, either attached to other algae, or like I said, leaf litter and that sort of thing. And that's because these things often live in streams and whatnot where there are currents. And if they're not attached, they would simply wash away. So let's see, we can, um, amoebas, amoebazoa, these are also um, uh, heterotrophs. They eat other things. You can see some chlorella, single celled green algae there. They always are kind of um, asymmetrical. When you're looking for living things under your microscope, typically you're looking for some sort of symmetry, radial symmetry, bilateral symmetry, some sort of geometric shape. Amoebas definitely don't do that. Um, they're blobby shaped and they move by extending these um, pseudopods uh, out in different directions. And you can see oftentimes when you find them, the internal organelles moving around in little currents and things. Uh, once again, I'll show you another video in a second for these. Um, so let's take a look at this video and you'll see the motion of three different groups here. So first of all, these larger um, blobs that are kind of dark gray, if you look here, you'll see the pseudopod extending out. And so that's an amoeba doing its amoeboid motion. If you don't see this kind of happening in process somewhere on the individual, you may find like this blob down here you're like, oh, look, there's a giant dark amoeba. But in fact, that's not, that's detritus. That's just broken up organic material. This is an amoeba. It's, you, you know, there's a little bit more uh, 
a uniform structure to it and you can see this organized internal movement. You, this thing, no, it's not. Um, okay, so you have amoebas. Then you have these large things here. Looks like they have clear spots in them. Pretty big, moving around. You'll see them move. They go in one direction and then they can back up sometimes and turn, um, especially when they back up and turn. You just saw one do it there. Um, these are ciliates, so paramecium. They're in, in the phylum ciliata, and they're moving by cilia. Um, finally, the third group you see here, these little teeny guys that are wobbling as they move through the water column. They're kind of tiny. Those are euglena. So those are the euglenoids we were talking about, and they're moving by flagella that spin like a propeller behind them. It gives them that kind of wobble as they go through the water, and they typically move in one direction. You won't see them back up ever because they can't reverse their flagella, so they're moving in one direction. Now, I mentioned to you before that often euglenoids have a single eye spot, um, but this magnification won't show it. You have to zoom in a little bit more to see the reddish eye spot on the euglena. But I can still tell by the way they move that they're flagellates at least. I can still tell that these paramecia are ciliates by the way they move. And the same with the um, amoeba. So sometimes the motion. So if we're gonna do any sort of uh, diagnosis on your particular slides, if you take a short video, it often helps immensely with the diagnosis of the, uh, at least the phylum level. Okay, so let's stop that and we'll move on. No, 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 there we go. Okay, so um, it might be, yeah, that's right, that you find things a little bit bigger and more complex than the single-celled uh, eukaryotes. And indeed, there are a lot of microscopic animals. Um, there are many different um, arthropods, for example. Arthropods, um, so kingdom animalia, or however you want to call that. Um, arthropods is a phylum, arthropoda. And it has uh, the key factor there. And in fact, the, the meaning of this name is jointed legs, huh? jointed feet. Um, and so arthro means joints, like arthritis is <laughs> the swelling of joints. And you look at their little arms and little legs and you'll actually see these sort of little segments, right? Especially here in this daphnia, you can see in their legs, it's got joints that they can bend at that articulate. Um, even this ostracod, which is a really weird one, you can see distinct joints in these legs. Um, this copepod here also joints in these appendages. Um, so you might find, so the um, arachnid version here, the water mite, is a little guy with jointed appendages. The Daphnia copepod and ostracod, these are all crustaceans, um, and they have sort of an outer shell. You can see the ostracod's kind of a weird one, kind of looks like a, like a bean or something. It's actually um, a, a weird um, arthropod version of a clam. Uh, so it actually has two shells that come together, and its legs stick out from inside, and that's what you see there. So sometimes you'll see these empty, or you'll see them open like this, like an open clam, um, and where, where the individuals died. Um, so they're all kind of strange. These are all, by the way, heterotrophs, so they all are sort of major consumers, probably second or third level consumers in these habitats. Um, it's a sign of, uh, of good health of a system to be able to support these large arthropods. You might find things that look like worms. And for our purposes, there's sort of three major categories of worm that you may find. These are all different animal phyla, again. And um, so a, a fairly common one is the flatworm, platyhelminthes. Um, and you'll see they don't have um, too much structure to them. They're often kind of oblong or kind of roundish at the ends. Um, they don't have specific uh, segmentation. You can find that's his mouth right there in the center, <laughs> or pharynx, and then it has a sort of digestive chamber. Um, and they often have eye spots, like two eye spots at one end, and they move in that direction. So for freshwater um, flatworms, they kind of look like these. Um, the segmented worms down here at the below, you might be like, well, these kind of look the same, except the segmented worm, you can see repeating segments. Even on this one here that's not very distinct, that's in the purple, you can still see these delineations for segments. 
And um, for, for many of the aniline worms, you can see these little hairs. Um, notice on this one, it's got these longer hairs and they're called setae and they're on each segment typically. Not, not always, but many of the segments have them. They're not jointed. That is, they have no joints in them, so they're not an arthropod. Um, but they use these little setae sometimes to move through the environment, like little paddles. So they're segmented, they have setae in the segments, and these are annelids. And then finally, the roundworm or nematode over here, they're usually pretty easy to tell. This one's under pretty high magnification. There's some little uh, cyanobacteria, individual cells around there to see for scale. And they're pointy, very pointy at both ends, the tail especially. If you really get good at this, you'll be able to tell the males from the females because the uh, males have a little hook at the end. But they're super pointy, no segments, no setae, and all they have is a hollow tube that runs through them, which is their digestive system. And they mostly eat bacteria and other detritus. And they, they move like little whips through the water. They can be little S curves, kind of moving quickly. You see them jerking around oftentimes. So they're, they're pretty distinct in their movements as well. So these are the, the three types of worms that you might see in your environment. Um, finally, uh, just one last animal um, that you're likely to see, and that's the rotifer. Um, rotifers, a little sketch over here. Uh, they have two crowns of cilia on their head. It's retractable, so they may not have those out. That can fold back in. Then they have a, a body with lots of organs in it, including a nice pharynx up here. You can often see the pharynx kind of chewing because it brings things in with the cilia and then its pharynx has like teeth and it grinds things up, which then goes into its intestine, stomach and intestine, just like you. And they often have a little forked tail that they attach to things with. And you'll often see a big current of things moving around on the cilia at the top there. So uh, rotifers are a completely different animal phylum and uh, they're all kind of microscopic like this. Kind of interesting, they're all female. <laughs> it's a completely uh, female uh, organism. They're, the entire phyla has no males. Um, and yet they reproduce, um, I guess I wouldn't call it sexually because they don't have a sperm and an egg, but they do undergo meiosis to produce genetic variability within the female. So every female will sort of produce these eggs, um, which go through meiosis and it'll recombine a bunch of the genes and then they send them out. So they do have genetic variety without actually having any males at all. So that's kind of an interesting like evolutionary note. We think of this as being an anomaly, but you know, rotifer is super, super, you know, abundant and diverse. Anyway, so that's kind of it for the, uh, the tour of things. Um, <laughs> the uh, the um, general idea is not to have given you uh, absolutely everything that you could see. Uh, I left off many different things that you potentially could see. This was intended to be just sort of a jump in sort of guideline to help you get started. Um, now, uh, in, in this sort of remote teaching environment, um, I, I'll be happy to, uh, if you take photos, um, maybe short videos and organize them, we can do a Zoom meeting and you can show me those and I can, we can talk about them and discuss like not only what they are, but what the significance is of their different relative abundances and things. Um, you should, by the way, in any sample, be able to find, you know, at least half a dozen different, you know, species. Um, if you're finding less than that, then there might be an issue. I mean, uh, things can obviously, you know, if you apply a treatment that's too dramatic, you can cause like local extinctions for sure. But in a in a in your sample, when you first get it, when you first put it in before the treatment, you should have gotten something that had at least six organisms. Um, I've been working with some students already and found uh, as many as 18 species in a single sample. So. It depends on where you get them, but a good natural sample will have lots and lots of species for you to work with. And then it makes it easier, of course, to do things like generate the, uh, the uh, ecological web and stuff. Anyways, I hope that was helpful. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's it for now.